Uh, following, we have uh, five talks from great speakers such as Diana Montalion. Hope I pronounce. Hope, hope I didn't mispronounce that too bad. Sorry, Diana. Uh, Actually, I want to start saying it the way you just said it. Yeah? I think you improved it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. You are very kind. <laughs> Uh, we also have Razvan uh, Prikic, Kevin, uh, Kevlin Henney, George Fairbanks, and Indu Alagar Sami. I'm, I'm very afraid of what I did to that name. But uh, first, we have Diana. C could you please let me know how do you pronounce? How, how should I pronounce it correctly? Montalian. Um, yeah, I say Montalian, but I actually okay. think Montalian is is the Mont better version. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, thank you. I, I will not make that mistake <laughs> again. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, to our audience that if you read the, the Economist or donated to Wikipedia or contributed to the World Monuments Fund, uh, then you've interacted with uh, the systems that uh, Diana helped architect. And I, I think I'm at two out of those three. <laughs> so I, I guess uh, I still need to contribute to the World the Monuments Fund and uh, yeah, I'll be three out of three. So thank you for, uh, for the great job you did there. Uh, her clients include Stanford, the Gates Foundation, and uh, of course, Teach for All. And she's co-founder of uh, Mentrix Group and Principal Systems Architect for the Wikimedia Foundation. That, that's quite uh, a resume you have there. Welcome, Diana. Well, thank you. Thank oh, it's, this is, it's early in the morning for me, and that is a great way to start the day, like better than coffee with appreciation of, of uh, what I care most about in the world. Thank well, you. So, so happy for that, but I, I must say it's because of the coffee in my case. <laughs> for us, <laughs> here in Romania, it's something like uh, 3 p.m., but we still have enough energy for the rest of the day. So luckily we got our uh, schedule synced. Uh, I, I have to say, regarding your talk for today, uh, one of the things I admire most in, in American schooling is the focus on debating as a, as a skill, I think. And I, I believe this teaches people to, to consider both their own point of view and uh, their counterparts' point of view, so that they're able to argue on both sides. That, at least that's my impression. Uh, and tell me, I was wondering, was this, was, was the debating environment your part of your inspiration for adopting systemic reasoning for, uh, for architecture, for arguing designs? Um, in a way, because we generally think of debate when we think of argumentation, but it actually isn't what argumentation in, it's, is meant to be in a holistic way. It isn't supposed to be one versus another necessarily, although that's one way of using it. But in our professional life, there's more than two people, more than two points of view. And also the goal is less about my reasons versus your reasons, and more about how you and I together can strengthen our reasoning towards some potential outcome to, so that we're actually contributing to the bettering of each other's um, argument as opposed to opposing each other with it. Yeah, so, so it's more about not, not sharing the pie, but increasing the pie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something like that. Yeah, exactly. Or not fighting yeah. over the pie. <laughs> well, except yeah, I, when I it's me and them. <laughs> I totally relate with what you're saying, Diana, because uh, if I need to be honest uh, with myself, I'm rarely the type of guy that uh, I know, brings from the start a brilliant uh, idea, the discussion table, although I would like to, but uh, it doesn't happen that often. But uh, for instance, I'm good at uh, I know, building on top of other people's ideas. When you have this sort of a discussion, that's how you get... Uh, very good outcomes. But, but well, yeah, that's gonna... a great segue. I'll take that. <laughs> I, I, I want that every time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But then uh, I think, yeah, I'm really looking forward to your uh, talk. So uh, I think we're going to give you the floor. And then we yeah, regroup yes. in uh, 40, 45 minutes uh, for uh, Q&A. Terrific. Great. Thanks. I will Thank share you. my screen. Start with my mountain lion picture. Good. Okay. You see the, are you seeing the slide? Yes. Yes. Terrific. Okay. So um, as we said, we're going to talk about architecture as systemic reasoning. 
And um, I couldn't possibly introduce myself better um, than uh, Vlad and Dan did. So I, what I will add is that my primary focus is uh, was building bigger and bigger websites, uh, web presences, and now it is uh, working sometimes with the same organizations to move towards designing for distribution, for the distribution of knowledge and information, uh, asynchronous components communicating with each other, um, because that's what the internet is, uh, an ever-expanding graph of components that need to talk to each other. So I wonder, and first, let me say, I'm very grateful. I'm so grateful that you've um, either come right here, right now, to uh, to join this this talk. I I love to talk about this, and I'm happy that um, you're interested. Or if you're watching this later in the recording, then uh, welcome forward in time. And I wonder how often do you are you able to know what you think needs to happen, tell people this is what needs to happen, and they say, great, thanks, and they act on it. So in my work, that very rarely happens. I don't necessarily think it should happen even, um, but it's why I love working in tech, the collaborative knowledge, the depth of knowledge, the differing perspectives and opinions and options. And it's also why I can really struggle and not like working in tech. So, so, so many opinions. Um, and so what do we do? And um, in architecture, this, this subject, what do we do? is essential because, as Fred Brooks says, conceptual integrity is the most important consideration in systems design, meaning the integration of the way we think about the problems that we're trying to solve. And when you work in a specific piece of software, it also gives you some boundaries for the language of how to come up with solutions, how to talk about challenges, but as you move towards systems, that becomes harder and harder. And we need to be able to think well and strongly and cohesively together if we hope to build well together and build strongly and cohesively. So the, the topic is argumentation. As we had talked about um, one aspect of argumentation is potentially debate. Um, but we're going to talk about what, what that, that word actually means. For me, it's the most essential skill um, that I use and need every day. And when I say argumentation, I don't mean the Monty Python skit. Um, uh, no, you didn't. Yes, you did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. What I mean is the process of reasoning systematically in support of an idea, action, or theory. And so I say, um, I called this talk reasoning systemically. I use them interchangeably. I've seen them both ways. I'm still trying to figure out which one I'm going to land on. When you're using argumentation in architecture, there are three different ways that you are potentially using it, or at least three different ways. One is that argumentation in architecture is a method of inquiry. Another is that you're enabling others to make up their own minds through reason giving. Argumentation involves the sense of consent that, that people are coming to their own conclusions, though you hope that they come to the same conclusion that you're advocating for. And the third is it's a core practice. It's something that we need to practice. So let's ex explore each one, inquire, reason, and practice. And we'll begin with um, our argumentation as a method of inquiry. So I have um, been doing workshops with people um, practicing uh, argumentation. 
and some really great examples of um, the ideas or theories that people um, came to the workshops wanting to um, strengthen were great architects need to also be great communicators, build as little as possible to satisfy the user's need, assigning gender based Assigning gender based on appearance is based on a binary system of gender, which ignores other genders. And my personal favorite, morning meetings are terrible. So inquiry is inquiring is a process that has the aim of augmenting knowledge, resolving doubt or solving a problem. So when we combine the definition of argumentation and the definition of inquiry, it's a process of reasoning systematically to augment knowledge, to resolve doubt, or to solve a problem, which is what I'm doing most of the time every day, regardless of how I'm doing it through conversation, through modeling, through prototyping. Um, it's still trying to learn something, trying to resolve and figure out um, what the best action to take might be or to solve a problem. The goal of argumentation, and when I say the goal of argumentation, I mean everyone involved, everyone involved in, in the process, is the best possible solution under the circumstances when conditions are uncertain. And here's the most essential uh, part of that sentence, right? Conditions are always uncertain, right? This is architecture, generally speaking. If we know the right answer and there's only one answer and it's obvious, then we would just do that. Generally, we're working in situations where you there's uncertainty. I would argue every situation um, has uncertainty, but that's a philosophical debate for another time. So what does this process of inquiring look like? So I'm going to give you an example from, from my life and then also show you how the example is in some ways weak. So the example um, is we should focus on encapsulation rather than expansion of the core software. So this is my, my idea of the best possible solution under the circumstances when conditions are uncertain. <laughs> so the first question is, what are the circumstances? Nothing is happening in isolation. Everything matters inside the circumstances, inside the context that we're in. So what are the circumstances in which encapsulation is an ideal um, idea? And what do we mean by best? What do we measure or know about what the best solution might be compared to other potential so solutions or what value is it going to bring that really matters to have? And so when I can understand the circumstances and convey those, and I understand what I mean by best by my idea, I also then need reasons to support it. And when I offer reasons to support it, they need to be true. They need to be relevant to the circumstances. They need to matter right now when compared to other concerns. They need to be sufficient. Have I examined it, the, have I examined the challenge or the idea from other points of view? And am I describing it in a well-defined way? So an example that I give is the word agile. If, you, if there are 10 people in the room and I say the word agile, it's likely that there'll be 10 different ideas of what I mean in the room. Uh, a lot of these words, for example, agile, are also based on a person's experience. And if we don't have the exact same experience of agile, then we'll have different definitions. So 
the thing that I love about uh, the world that I work in is that I can't actually build reasoning to support most of my ideas by myself because there's it's too complex. There's too much to know, um, and only some of which I know. And so this approach to inquiring, as I think most um, building things well together, involves proactively seeking out other points of view, proactively seeking out knowledge that I don't necessarily have through, through reading or discussion, experience, other people's experience. So another way of thinking about the process of argumentation is that you're synthesizing knowledge, experience, and good judgment into decisions based on valid reasons. So one of the more important things to be aware of is concrete. We often begin inquiries with the desire for concrete answers, concrete outcomes. And concrete absolutely has its place and has its time. My house, the foundation of my house is concrete. Um, but the process of argumentation is and always must be defeasible. It's, it, it, if the circumstances change, then so does the strength of the reasons and the strength of the, the, the claim itself, the idea itself. And so when I'm engaged in this process and I'm engaged in this process with others, I am looking to improve or change or inconsistently change over time when necessary my conclusion. I am not looking so much to defend it. Right, because if, if things have changed, then I need to look again. So that's argumentation as inquiry. Now we'll talk about reason giving. Argumentation is reason giving. And this goes with, um, as we said, the point is to enable other people to also make up their own minds. What convinced you? What convinced me? that the idea that I'm presenting is true and valuable and worthy of pursuing. So you begin with your reasons and then strengthen them until they're strong and cogent. Usually three to five reasons, we're gonna talk about what strong is, but also that they hang together and they lead to the conclusion. So they're convincing as a group. So back to my example, we should focus on encapsulation rather than expansion of the core software. And my reasons, this will enable us to build modern software patterns without rewriting all of the legacy code. We can deploy the highest priority business goals quicker by integrating sources of content and establishing communication between them. Other similar systems, and I give an example, have adopted these patterns and succeeded at accomplishing similar goals. So I begin with my idea and the reasons that support it. And then my goal is to strengthen them. How do I make it the whole, the, the whole um, view of it stronger? So the first is, is it true? Is it true? Is it verifiably accurate? What might, I, what might I need to research? What might I need to find out? So I say that we can deploy the highest priority business goals quicker. But how do I know that? How fast do we deploy them now? What would, what would in what way would they be quicker? And I can strengthen my argument here by adding some validators to my reason. Also, you almost always want to give two relevant examples. So you can find one example of almost anything, two is stronger. 
And also they need to be apples to apples. You need to be giving examples that are uh, in similar circumstances. So we see here, I said that I would include an example, but I can strengthen it by offering two and also demonstrating that the circumstances in which I'm focusing on the, so the, the software, that the software um, examples I give have similar, similar qualities. So relevance, this is also inference. In other words, do my reasons, are they strongly connected to the claim? And it's also helpful if they're also strongly connected to the circumstances, but are they strongly connected to the idea that I am trying to support? And so here I'm saying that encapsulation rather than expansion, will enable us to build modern software patterns. But the weakness there is that encapsulation might set the groundwork, might make it easier, but I'm not really making a connection to then how will encapsulation actually let us build modern patterns? Wouldn't we need more than just encapsulation in order to move in that direction? so I could potentially strengthen there. And then wait. So it needs to be matterful under the circumstances. And ideally it needs to be matterful right now that we have many ways that we could spend our time, energy and attention, many things that, um, that some budget would probably help. And so when we, are, um, when we are strengthening our ideas or our solutions, we want to be able to demonstrate that they matter compared to other matterful things. So as you can see in, in my example, I am actually not giving a reason about why it is the most important thing right now under the circumstances. And I could add by adding that, it would strengthen it. So facts, is it true? Inference, uh, relevance and weight, matterfulness makes the, um, makes the work stronger. You also want to ensure that it's sufficient. Are you leaving out, for example, a valid reason for not coming to your conclusion? Um, there are definitely good arguments against what it is that I'm saying. And have I, have I examined them? And do I include some information about why I still recommend going in this direction? So that when people engage with it, they they can see that there's sufficiency here. That this is a this is more of an art than a science. Definitely not encouraging all points of view that could possibly ever be convolute this this lovely um, uh, way of thinking that you're developing. But at the same time, you definitely don't want it to be a very thin slice of the pie. And well defined. So so much trickiness with with words. This this is the most common tripping point, and it always surprises me because you tend to get very far down the road before you realize that you actually don't think of a particular word in the same way, and you've never really been talking about the same thing. So in our example, encapsulation. What do I mean by encapsulation? And when other people are, are coming to the similar conclusion, do they mean the same thing? So I would define that. Other potentials are modern. What do I mean by modern? And patterns. You know, I, I, I rely a lot on patterns. Patterns are the, a big uh, tool in my, a common tool in my toolbox, but that might not be true for everyone involved in helping me, helping me to strengthen the reasoning. So we want our reasoning to be strong and sufficient and well-defined. 
So the third thing that argumentation is, is a practice. And it's a very um, humbling and curiosity driven um, practice. And we need to practice because we're actually really bad at this. Um, we, we are, there are so many um, uh, conditioned thoughts and feelings and patterns and socio-technical patterns and, and uh, many things that get in our way. And simultaneously, we think we're really good at this. And one thing that happens, and it still surprises me though it happens every single time, is I really know, I really know this is what I think is the right thing to do. And I start to model out my reasons and they're awful. <laughs> like, they're not connected really well, or um, I've just brought in something that I'm not even sure is true, but it really felt strong to me to begin with. And so it, this, this work um, requires a tremendous amount of self-awareness. And that's not a skill that we often cultivate in tech is this process of self-awareness, but you really have to get your Zen on and become mindful of how you think and also how you react to others thinking. I, I practice and practice and practice and still my first response when someone says something I disagree with is no, 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 no. And I wanna explain to them why the answer is no. And I really need to work on the ability to uh, to lean in and say, you know, yes, take in their idea and then help to strengthen it as opposed to push back on it. So the other challenge is we don't think in systems. Um, as systems architect, obviously we need to, or I need to, um, but not everyone I interact with does. And I also find it a continuous challenge generally we're trying to linearize and order and categorize things and when we do this we are also simultaneously building the house of cards that as soon as circumstances change there's a little shake or a little wind goes by then the whole thing is gonna is gonna collapse and when in systems thinking as we say we're predominantly focused on synthesis on synthesizing knowledge and experience and good judgment we are, um, we are looking at the whole and the connection in the, in the relationships. And we're often doing this in an environment that will want to push towards a linear delivery schedule or a, um, uh, an OKR structure. And these things are fine and, and they're very helpful. Sometimes isolation, for example, is a great way to get something started. So it's not good or bad as much as it is a different way of thinking and cultivating a different way of thinking. And we know that that is absolutely essential to our success in designing systems because Conway's law, organizations which design systems will produce um, designs that are the copies of their communication structure. So the most impactful thing we can do is improve the strength of the communication structure, improve the, uh, the outcome, the coming up to the, with the best possible solutions under the circumstances in the midst of uncertainty and strengthening the ability to, um, to support those ideas, to decide what's next. So, the first thing that happens when we are engaged in inquiry and reason giving and practice is we run straight into doubt. I mean, smack straight into doubt, like just, just full speed to the, the wall of doubt. And doubt is the experience of uncertainty. It's what happens in our bodies, in our feelings, in our mental models. It's what happens when we feel doubt. Doubt is uncomfortable. Uncertainty is uncomfortable. And when we move into that uh, discomfort, it, gets, it can get a little crazy for a little while as people are trying to settle in to, to figure out um, 
what this uncertainty means and people respond very differently too to being in doubt. The most often asked question I get is what do you do about the feelings? What do you do about the feelings that, that come up when you're um, engaged in change and dialogue that means change? So sometimes it's necessary doubt. Like, so doubt is essential to this. It's the fuel of our inquiry, right? Because the conditions are uncertain, we have doubt, we're not sure. And it, it's what encourages us to want to strengthen our reasons. And so, um, and we don't know. There's no way to really know. So sometimes it's necessary doubt. Often it's fear. And the strategic engagement with the two are, are different. So when you're engaging necessary doubt, it more often has the quality of being respectful and curious, being asked questions. Huh, so what do you mean by that? And how, oh, you know, what, what, I wonder if we, it's more of a lean in, it's more of an engage. It um, tends to be experimental. Like, oh, I don't really know. What could we do to figure this out? Put our hands in something. Um, tends to be very light touch. Like, huh, well, we don't know, but I think this, let's, let's take these few steps as opposed to overly concrete or committed too soon. Like basically promise me this is the right answer. And it allows space for uncertainty. Like we don't actually need to resolve all of the doubts. We're okay with having some, some doubt. Um, it's more of a how much doubt is too much doubt. So when it's fear, it tends to be dismissive, right? Right off. No, nope, nope. There's no movement from your own mind or from other, other people's minds. It's, you know, I don't, eh, I don't really want to engage with this. Uh, talk to the hand, uh, shaking head, crossing arms, um, body postures that, that suggest fear are uh, a lean back instead of lean in. Um, people stay on the sidelines. So basically they engage with the reasoning by saying, well, I don't agree, but whatever, do whatever, whatever. And as we've said, argumentation is a process that people are engaged in together. So when someone is staying on the sidelines, it's another way of saying no or dismissing. Fear thinking tends to be very all or nothing. There's a right answer and a wrong answer. And that's what you're trying to figure out. What's right, what's wrong. And if you do the right thing, everything will be happy puppies and rainbows and lollipops. And if you do the wrong thing, then everything will be a total and complete catastrophe. So when you're engaged in that, when you have that type of thinking in your mind or you're engaged with it in your, with other people, Usually that's not doubt, it's fear. And it also encourages the desire to answer all the questions before something um, is, is, is acceptable. So if I can think of any questions that I don't have an answer to, then that automatically negates the, um, negates agreement. And in fact, because it's uncertainty, it's not possible to answer all the questions, as we said, you're looking to be sufficient. So uh, probably even most more important when dealing with fear is working with your own reaction because we're often adding drama. That when, when somebody is interacting in a reasoning process, when somebody is interacting um, out of fear, and they're saying things that maybe aren't very well reasoned, we tend to switch into fight mode or uh, frustration. We get frust frustrated. And as soon as that starts to happen, we're going to increase the fear rather than decrease the fear. And so it's really important to become skillful. And I, I, I am learning this skill myself very slowly. <laughs> I, I, I don't, 
I don't know if I will ever really truly just breathe through um, challenging situations, but I do hope hope that the practice improves my ability to do um, uh, to do so. Because the challenge is that the fear isn't going to lessen until there's a new experience. And this is the paradox of argumentation, is you can have the most, the, the most clear, best possible solution despite uncertainty, and you can have the reasoning be really strong, but you won't actually lessen um, really necessary doubt or fear until you've actually taken steps in that direction and have some experiences that validate it, that, that make it real. And so one of the most effective things when um, there's a lot of blocking on, um, on accepting an idea or exploring an idea is to just find one tiny step that can give a new experience that can help the conversation then continue. And another uh, essential piece of this too is also um, knowing when not to practice argumentation. So as soon as anyone in the room can say to some extent, I don't care what you say. I don't have to, I, I can just make, I can just tell you what to do. You're actually not engaged in argumentation or systemic reasoning, you are engaged in power dynamics. And there's a whole, that would be a whole nother talk to consider um, how to engage with those. But generally in that moment, it's best to step back, take a breath, regroup and reconsider as opposed to what I usually do, which is I try and argue, uh, give more reasons. I talk more, I give more information. I try and, 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 um, push against the hand and it's very, the, the no, it's very ineffective. And so there is definitely um, a part of the practice is this Aikido type of um, ability to, um, to know when you can and when you can't effectively structure argumentative or argumentation in, in a situation. So we, uh, despite our best efforts, we run into the wall of doubt and we must always um, speak to it. And the other thing that we in, run into are fallacies. So back to the, we're not very good at this. There are a lot of ways that our mind structures logic that actually, and they're gonna feel really um, true and they aren't their fallacious thinking and being able to discover them in ourselves and in other people is an essential practice for strengthening your reasons because you'll notice when you've gone astray and um in american football there was i think he is retired now there was a referee ed hockley and ed hockley when he explained what was happening in the game, he's a lawyer, he would give long and precise and detailed uh, information about the, the call that he was making on the field, which made him personally, made him my favorite and many, uh, many people who watch the game. And so some clever person took logical fallacies and combined it in a meme with Ed Hockley and, um, and his, his, long, his long reasoning. So we're going to use this meme to give just a few examples of the type of fallacies that are really common, uh, in, certainly common in, in my world and, and probably yours as well. So the first is an ad hominem attack. And this is when you attack the person or a quality of the person instead of the person's argument. So for example, um, uh, I, in recommending, in some of the tool sets that I have recommended, one um, pushback was, um, oh, you're so corporate. You're too corporate, that you're very corporate, which 
I predominantly work in open source, so that's actually not the case. But even if I was too corporate, it doesn't mean that my reasons aren't sound. Another one is, oh, you complicate everything. I might complicate everything, that may be true, doesn't mean that my reasons aren't sound. You have to actually engage the reasons and not qualities of the person who's giving the reasons. Uh, a personal incredulity foul. So, and it's very surprising how often this comes up. And it's basically when you've said something and the person doesn't understand it or doesn't really like it, and therefore it's not valid. Um, it's a way, it's a way of the sidelines that we talked about. It's a way of saying, well, I didn't understand it. So therefore it, it isn't well, it isn't well reasoned and it, and it won't be well reasoned until I personally am interested in it. And that of course is not the case. We need to engage the reasons themselves and not what it, whether and not our interest level. Um, this is, uh, particularly in my country lately, a common fallacy of a call for moderation. So this is when you have two people that are diametrically opposed. There's one answer on this side and one answer on that side. It's assuming that the correct answer is a, um, is somewhere in the middle, that a compromise, if you compromise or you go somewhere in the middle is the right answer. And that is, of course, completely random um, assumption that you have to engage the reasons uh, for either of those things for and make the sound, the most sound um, integration of them that you can. And it might be that one of them is correct and the other one isn't. It's not predetermined. And so this is, this is, this is so uh, common, it's a meme, but it, a legal proof reversal. So attempted to shift the burden of proof on the doubter. So we see this in this direction, which is me saying this is so, and someone having necessary doubt, and me saying, well, you have to prove your doubt, as opposed to if it's necessary doubt, focusing on strengthening the reasons, focusing on strengthening, adding with some of the techniques we've talked about, the kinds of things that would help to, um, would help to alleviate the, the necessary doubt as opposed to, well, you can't, you can't say it isn't. If I say it is, but you can't say it isn't, then I must be right, which is not the case. And this also goes the other way, the change my mind meme. Change my mind is not argumentation. As we've said, everyone joins together. It's something you're leaning in, you're strengthening the reason, and now you're changing the burden of proof uh, to the person standing across the, the table. And um, we even think of the change my mind person as a lean back, arms crossed, make me think differently. Okay, so that is, um, that is now question time. Hmm? Absolutely. Well, we, have, we do have a, a couple of questions. Um, actually, one of them is, a, is an appreciation. Um, they're saying they never thought about structuring of an architect pitch, so... That's very nice. Okay. Uh, a question would be, how do you reconcile feedback from opposing team members? From team members who are diametrically opposed, actually. Yeah, so, um, so first it's, it's challenging. It's, it's challenging, especially when, again, it's uncertain. So there really isn't a way to know who's right and who's not. And when you're, you want, when you, when it's your team, you want things to stay comfortable and, and connected and curious together. And when, when you've got two ideas that are really diametrically opposed, I think my first thought is really just acknowledging that that's 
what's happening, right? Because, you know, we, we tend to get so involved in the, no, this tool, no, that tool, like, and, and that we kind of like it, that we sort of forget the tension of what we're doing. And then the second is to go into the reasoning um, as quickly as possible. So a really good question is, what convinced you? What convinced you that your view is correct? And, and um, even open up a mural and model those reasons and then do the same for the other person, what convinced you? One trick that I've seen help quickly is remembering it only depends in the circumstances. The question is, in this circumstance, which one of these would meet our goal? So you take the reasons for one and the reasons for another and compare those to the goal itself, to the circumstance itself, and see if you can't see which reasons more strongly move you where you wanna go in this circumstance, as opposed to a general idea that one is better than the other because it depends. The, honestly, as an architect, that would be my tattoo, right? Is the answer to every question. It depends. That, that's, that's, um, <laughs> that's a very true <laughs> thing to say. And also, so basically just to remind them that they share a common goal and try to focus the diametrically opposed people towards the same common goal. Yeah, and that the and and um, trying to come up with the strongest reasons they can for whatever the solution is like that. But what's it's more important that the reasoning is strong than the answer is right. One of the things I say in this is that you're trying to be correct, not right. And those are very in me. Those are very different things. And being correct is not quite as interesting to me as being right. It, being right is really <laughs> so. It's easy for us to get carried away. Yeah. Well, plus, it's, it's fun to win, but uh, yeah, yeah, not at yeah. the expense of uh, relationships. Uh, I think we we do have uh, some other questions. Dan, can you take the next one? Oh, that's my cue. All right. Uh, before that, I also have to say that I was listening as a, I was listening to the talk, and uh, in my head was, yeah, this happened, and this happened to me, <laughs> and that was a, a true story at the moment. So definitely relate to what you were saying. Uh, let's take. Uh, there's. I'm gonna. For instance, the final one, because uh, you also touched a bit. Did you thought about uh, the tool fallacy, like when you was want to use this tool because it's newer? especially when you want to use a new tool or a new programming language in a new project, uh, then you also have opposing forces. Uh, some that are on the more conservative side, now it's too risky, then you never get to do it. Uh, or the other ones that say, yeah, jump right in. Yeah, oh, I'm, who, uh, thank you for that question. Like that, thank you, that's the-, the I can take the credit, it's uh... <laughs> to To whoever did that, that's the perfect right question. And I'm gonna answer it in two ways, um, but they're the same way. Um, I was giving a talk at O'Reilly and someone sat at my lunch table and said, um, oh, you're an architect, I wanna be an architect, but I don't know enough about Kubernetes yet. I'm like, oh, wrong table. Like, <laughs> like now that you've heard me give a talk, I think it's obvious that architecture isn't Kubernetes for me. Now, Kubernetes is a tool and it's this thing I need to be knowledge about, about and all of that. It's important, but it, one of the biggest logical fallacies in tech is this, is making the argument, we need insert tool. So I'll use Kubernetes again. We need Kubernetes because we don't have Kubernetes. And therefore, if we get Kubernetes, we'll solve our problem, which is the lack of Kubernetes. And that's, we make so many arguments that way in favor of a tool, of a particular tool. And that may be absolutely true, but what about the circumstance? What are the, what's the capability we're missing? What can the organization or the business or the can't do or is doing poorly that is critical to the mission that a tool would help us with? So 
if we don't have any of that language yet, we need to go get that language first in the circumstances. Why does this matter in the circumstances? Um, and then for me, it's the focus on capabilities, right? What is this tool enable that is essential to enable? And once you kind of have that together, then when you're talking about the tool or the tool set itself, the reasoning gets relatively easy because you're staying in your lane now. So for example, a one that's really big right now is um, event driven versus event sourcing and where's the source of truth and the stream and what's in the stream versus SQS messages, like how you orchestrate events between components. And what's really good um, is that we don't know the answer so it's not, do we use Kafka? We're designing the event part and we don't know the answer, but the, the most relevant things are on the table in a way people are excited and engaged about trying to figure out the, the, the right tool. And so, um, so when it happens, it's a really great investigative process and, and you're bringing curiosity to it. And when you get stuck, go back to the circumstances. Yeah. Plus it's, um, I, I think it's helpful to avoid the latest uh, craze, you know, because every, every, all the time there is something new and shiny that uh, you'd like to, to experiment with. But yeah, uh, my, yeah, once you step back. My, um, with, with engineering, with myself, when engineering was my, what I did, right? And with engineering teams, my question is always, um, why is new valuable? Like, so if you're cutting edge something or other, and all of your revenue is generated by the fact that you use the most cutting edge tools, then sure, but almost nobody fits that description. So new needs to be valuable and it needs to offset the risk of being an early adopter. And over the, the last 15 years, when we've been building things, we're always looking for that. Sometimes we're willing to take the beta risk to get the capabilities and other times. And I, my last story is that um, at a team member, and we used to be at odds about this all the time. And he, he always wanted something new and I'd be conservative and he'd be like, you're old. And I'm like, you're young. Like you're to like, it became, and in a fun way, right? It became like, I'm, I don't want to do the new hot thing. And he always wants to do the hot thing. And I'm too fearful. And he's not thinking clear, you know, forward thinking. And we, it was beautiful because we usually came to an agreement and when we did, we could really trust it was probably the right agreement if we both came to the same conclusion. And most of the time we did. Not no. always, but most. <laughs> because he was young, right? Too young. Too young. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. I mean, in fairness, he was right as often as I was right, right? Like that's, we, we start, it's just we don't start in the same place, right? Of course, of course plus different experiences. Right. Um, but that sounds like an ad hominem attack, right? Yeah, in it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In in a way, for us, it was a way of um, it was a way of uh, diffusing that of you know saying that I'm frustrated because you kind of always start here, and it's like, well, I'm frustrated because you never seem to learn that there are consequences to these, right? But in fact, it was you know, it would if it was a negative situation that would have been a terrible, terrible thing. Like, so I definitely do not want to sound like I'm encouraging name calling. It was a situation where there was a lot of trust and, and a lot of um, willingness to solve the problem. And so it was just funny to us that we always started in that place and, and then could, could move forward. And, um, you know, I still, one of the best, um, we built great stuff together, really, was one of a, the better experiences, yeah. But uh, I think what's nice about these stories and examples is that, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, if you hear them, you say, yeah, okay, this happens to other people, so uh, <laughs> it doesn't just happen to me. But then also it's nice to see various ways to diffuse certain situations. You have clashes in such uh, meetings or debates and then you need to find a way around it. And I think, uh, yes, yeah, we have a lot of questions, probably we won't have uh, time for all of them. And we will pick, Vlad will pick one more, but a lot of them are in this area. What, what would you do in certain situations? 
Um, well, apart from the the kind person that uh, says I look like Guilfoyle, I'll have to to look this up. <laughs> <laughs> um, one I one I liked, and I've been yeah, leading my way to this is what is the best way to practice so that we can improve our communication and not fall into fallacies uh, so quickly? Yeah, because uh, I think the, the default response is just to go to a fallacy because, because it's a mental shortcut, mm, right? Yeah. How, what, what kind of rituals are there to, to avoid taking those shortcuts? Great question. Oh, these are great questions. Um, first, I want to respond to the situation, the, there being a lot of questions about situa specific situations and say, right now, I am in the midst of a couple of situations that I have absolutely no idea how to move them out of where they are, like, and it's really uncomfortable. And so I think this reminder that we can bring all of this really good strategy, but it's also hard every day. And it, no matter how many we resolve, we're going to be in one that feels we don't know that we don't know how to resolve. And so I, 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 I just want to remind, I think, people that it's a part of the reason it's a practice is that there's no perfection. There's no place in which you know how to this, this doesn't fix everything. Sometimes you just have to be patient. <laughs> no, all the time. And I'm not a very patient person. So, so, um, so to the ritual question, so what I've started to do, and I had a meeting yesterday where um, we, we were trying to craft our response to architectural thinking in another team. And we were really frustrated and struggling. And so we did what I've started doing every time, which is we started to model it. And something, just index cards or Trello board or Miroese, Miro, Mural, where you put, this is what we think is the conclusion. This is what we think are the reasons. Add some notes, continue either writing or talking or modeling, whatever it is you're doing that you're trying to sort this out. And I was, I did it working on um, an artifact. I changed it about 57 times. Like I kept going back and like, oh, that, wait, I stuck this in. So I think if one of the best practices to help short circuit our quick answers is to literally look at them to literally make some cards for ourselves to look at them and, um, and interact with them that way and move them around. Also partnering with other people whose feedback loops strengthen your thinking, who are good at um, or willing to practice this with you because you cannot see what you cannot see. Everyone has implicit bias. So I can do the <clears throat> best argumentation process ever and then it's still wrong. It's still missing something. So partnering with other people and establishing good feedback loops um, and you know, more time with the easier ones and less time with the harder ones. This is a little more energetic. Thank you. So, so basically just taking a step back and uh, yeah, trying to, to get also other people's uh, insights to un understand their points of view, not to just yours. Yeah. And mod, like phys it, it, um, physically, mod even just physically modeling it, even in the simplest way, for mm -hmm. me, changes the way my brain is engaging with it. I s literally see it different. I'm not a visual person. I'm more obviously word. I'm a wordy person. Um, but the ritual of having people quickly just open a board and try and model out what they're saying changes the way that they, be they interact with it. Not every time, but often. Oh, that, that's a really cool tip. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Diana. It's, uh, it's been a great talk, an awesome way to start the conference. Uh, yeah, it's too bad we don't have more time to tackle these uh, subjects, but we'll definitely reach out to you to, for one of our next conferences. Wonderful. Hope and I'm also <laughs> at, at Diana Montalian on Twitter. Lots of architectural fun chats we have there. I have, I'm really blessed with that community. So people are free to come there and continue the conversation if they'd like. Cool.
Great. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Take care.